Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners welcome and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I'm Louise, your host, International Passion Ambassador. I'm so excited about my guest today, Grant Cameron. Welcome. Grant Cameron has been a UFO researcher since 1975. Grant is a world-recognized expert on presidents and UFOs, the Canadian government and UFOs, the alien music connection and the relationship of consciousness to UFOs. He is the winner of the Leeds Conference International Researcher of the Year and the UFO Congress Researcher of the Year. Grant has spent decades watching and chronologicing developments around extraterrestrial contact. He is the author of Charlie Red Star. In the past few years, Grant has turned his research interests to the search for the ultimate reality, where the aliens have become less alien with every passing day and the message of oneness and love becomes more and more real. This is his story and this is his passion, Grant. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Beautiful, wonderful introduction, and I'm I'm honored to be on. As I said, I, I I found your show, and I found it fascinating, and I love the intros that you do. Oh, thank you. I love your I love your show as well, <laughs> and I'll put all the links for people to connect with you, and we'll discuss it later. But I'd love to um, touch on your UFO sighting, the Charlie Red Star. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you the background. Um, I was raised very religious. I was my mother, my dear mother wanted me to be a minister. Uh, so that was sort of a background. And it was sort of like um, there were miracles, but I never seen a miracle. So I was having the doubt that there was such a thing as, you know, weird stuff or miracles or whatever. And I had no interest in UFOs. I did have interest in Edgar Casey. I was interested in that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was at university. I was very frustrated. Um, I thought the university was a total waste of time. I had no idea why I was there. I wondered, like in calculus, where the numbers had gone. I was trying to think, how are you ever going to make any money at this nonsense? And it was that when it, that's when it happened. It was, it was started in um, February of 1975. I live in a city of about 700,000 people. This happened about 30 miles outside the city at a, a town called Carmen, Manitoba, which is about 25 miles from the U.S. border. And it was in the newspaper and it was, it's Char they called it Charlie Red Star and it was being seen almost every night. So I said to my friend, we used to do, we used to uh, drive around the city, which was the same as university. Like it was basically a waste of time. So we drive around the city and drive around the city and drive around the city and not do anything. So I said to my friend, Larry, I said, Hey, let's go see what they're looking at. And he said, okay, we'll go. And we never did go. And then three months later, um, a local TV station caught this thing jumping off the ground. And then it went viral. Suddenly they had a, a TV thing. They did the documentary. And I said, come on, let's go. Let's go see what they're looking at. And the way I always describe it is I bought the lottery ticket knowing that there's a chance I'm going to win. But you're not going to win. I mean, we'll bundle up, but we're not going to see anything. We went out there and we drove around for an hour. There was two of us and there was a guy in the back seat, And we're looking around at the stuff. And we're going, like, what are they looking at? What's everybody looking at? And um, we drove in the town, out of the town, in the town, around the town. And then my friend says, uh, he says, okay, we'll go back in town one more time. If we don't see anything, let's go home. I said, great, been a total waste of time. We turn around to go back into town and it appears from the left to the right. Now we were saying, what is this? What is this? You know, what are they looking at? As soon as it appeared, everybody went, there it is. We instantly knew there was no question. Nobody asked, is that what it is? It appeared from the left to the right. It was down very low, only a couple hundred feet off the ground. It was not a light in the sky. It was an object. It was in really close to the car. And it flew right in front of the car across the road coming from the south from the American border to going into the north. It was red. It was blood red. It looked like it was alive. It was pulsing like a plasma object. It was bobbing up and down. It was sort of moving up and down. And I couldn't get enough. I just like I was getting out of the car as the car was still moving because it was going in behind this set of school buses that were parked outside this town. And I, I knew it was going to be behind the buses. I wouldn't be able to see it. And that was sort of like my moment where I grabbed Alice by the hand and I jumped down the rabbit hole and I've never come out since. It was just, that was my passion harvest. That's when it started. It was like, <laughs> just, and that's what happens to people who have paranormal events. Uh, they just can't let it go. It's, it, and that's why paranormal events are always so weird. They make it weird because you can't let it go. You keep thinking about it. You keep thinking about it. So what I did is I got all my friends and I said, you got to come see this. This, you've got to see this. This is unbelievable. And I drag all my friends out there two nights later. And we are standing there on a road and there's, there's cars all over the place because people from the city are there trying to see this thing. 
And the second night, uh, my friends say, okay, we're going home. I said, no, no, you got to stay, stay, stay. You got to see this thing. Said, no, no, we're going home. We're hungry. We're going back to Winnipeg for pizza. And all my friends took off. There was eight people left when they came the second night. It came about 15 minutes after my friends left. And this time it was bouncing around the sky. It was jumping around the sky. It was this flashing thing, jumping around the sky. And there was these kids that we'd taken and they said, hey, is that it, Grant? And I go, I guess so. It didn't look like what I'd seen the first night. And as it got closer, it actually changed to a different object. It was jumping around. It was a flashing object. And as it came closer, it was the same object I'd seen the first night. And it's down again, very low to the ground, maybe a couple hundred feet off. And it's coming right at us. It's like we're looking right at it. It's coming right at us. And uh, I remember there's a girl, as we were jumping around the sky, the car beside us, the girl was crying. She couldn't see it because it was moving around the sky. And she's crying. Someone show it to me. And people are swearing and they're yelling and, and they're jumping up and down. And the, the guy had a camera in the other um, car and they had what were called motor drives from a Nikon camera in 1975 where it would advance the film very fast. And I can still remember this girl is, is crying. People are yelling and, and, and screaming. And I could hear this camera go click, zzz, click. And he's unloading the camera as this thing's coming towards us. And then it came right at us. And then it just sort of made a turn and it went off into the north. And I remember looking at it and I thought, wow, that could be from another planet. And then the thing that stuck me 46 years, the next thought that came into my head, I, I looked at it and I said, but what's it doing? It's not doing anything. And that was the thing that stuck with me is like, why, what is actually going on? Wow. And so yes. I, I put, I went, I talked to everybody in the town. I interviewed all these people and they would always do the same thing. Oh, I, I, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, well, so-and-so say so you saw something. And they'd say, well, it really wasn't anything. And then it was like something sitting in the middle of the road or something. And then they would squeal on somebody else or three people. And I'd have this whole list of people. I wrote this manuscript up and I remember I went to try to get it published and nobody could care less. They, they couldn't. And it was a big story where I was from and the local publisher who should have published it said, Mr. Cameron, you may believe in this kind of stuff. Count me among the unbelievers. And I went, what? <laughs> I just looked floored. And I thought, that's it. No more sayings. And, and I said, it's like a good story. I can tell you the story of what happened. And I was close five times. I was so close in 76. I was going to jump on the thing. So I have these interesting stories, but nobody cared. Like the publishers didn't care. And then I was, all I was concerned about was somebody's got to know what's going on here. I mean, I'm, I'm this, uh, you know, yokel from Winnipeg, Manitoba in the middle of the farmland. I don't know what's going on, but somebody's got to know. And that's why I started this pursuit. I went after the Canadian government. I went after, I ended up following the former president of Penn State University around. 14 honorary doctorate degrees, co-developer of the homing torpedo, chairman of the board of the biggest inst uh, defense institute in the United States. And he would tell us rhymes and riddles. And it ended up at the president at the president's. And I was looking for some files at the, at the Truman Library. And that's when I thought, hey, president's some most powerful guy in the world. He's got to know what's going on. And I started this pursuit going through all the presidential libraries. And in the end, what happened was I'm in a situation now where I really don't believe anything I believed in 1975. Uh, I believe there are very few people who know what's going on and have come to a completely different conclusion as to what's going on. And I guess I would what it sum up from my sighting to where I am now, I would say whatever we're dealing with now is a lot less physical than you think it is. It's a lot more spiritual than people think it is. It is 1,000, at least 1,000 times more complex than people think it is. And the number one message is only one message, oneness. That is the message. It's a giant kabuki theater. They want you to know that the reality is not what you think it is. And you start to think, like, what's going on? Something's wrong here. Reality isn't the way I think it is. And when you get to the bottom of the line, I think the number one message is oneness. Wow, that just opens up a whole box of so many more questions, Grant. Yeah. I'm backtracking, right, because I can't wait to get onto the message and your new insights and the whole oneness, but ha have you seen an extraterrestrial? No. Uh, and in fact, now I would even say that I, I am, I'm very uncertain whether there is extraterrestrials. I mean, I've gone that far. I, I've had experiences. I've had, as I, 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 so I did this chase through the presidents, the Canadian government, you know, president of Penn State University, all these high level guys, all the high level CIA people I chased around. They know who I am. And um, I ended up um, in a situation where I wasn't getting any answers. 
I figured the government may know what's going on. There may be some people in the government that knows what's going on. Very few people in the government, but there's a few people who know, but they're not going to tell you. So it was like a total waste of time. And I started to have, I had the experience in 2012. That's when this shift took place, where I moved from nuts and bolts. And I'm watching a lecture by Colin Andrews, who's the guy who developed crop circles. And it's the same thing as the UFO thing. Almost everything that happened to me, I didn't intend to do. I wasn't interested in it. So uh, I didn't, was interested in UFOs, never thought about extraterrestrial life. In 2012, I met a lecture given by Colin Andrews, who does the crop circles. He invented the term crop circle in Phoenix, Arizona. And it was one of these conferences where it goes from eight o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. I, and you, you don't go to a lecture. So you just figure I'm going for lunch for this one. I'm not interested in this. And it was crop circles. I thought, nah, I'm not interested in crop. I'm not going to go. And I thought, well, he's like one of the most prominent researchers in the world. I should go and pay him the respect. I should go watch him lecture. So I go into the lecture and the thing was that I wasn't paying attention. And this is where I get into this. I wrote this book called Contact Modalities. So there are ways, everything's in the field. All the answers are in the field. And I'm there and I'm daydreaming, which is one of the contact modalities. You sort of, you're zoning out, you're meditating, you're thinking about doing other things. And all of a sudden it was like, bang, like that. Boom, all this stuff came into my head. There was three things. They put the puzzle together and it was like, whoa. And, it's, and it basically said, the answer, you had that question in 1975, what's going on here? What is this? And it basically said, the answer is consciousness. And I, and I always joked about it because I said, in 2012, when I walked into that lecture hall, I couldn't have spelled consciousness and I could not have cared less. It was the last <laughs> thing. I just like consciousness, like what, what do you mean consciousness? And then I started to look at it. And what happened in 2013, I had another event where I'm giving my first consciousness lecture, the connection to, that I believed that was consciousness, what it had told me. It said, uh, like this former president of Penn State University had asked us at one point, he said, let me, let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? And the guy from Great Britain that was, answered, was interviewing him said, uh, I, don't, I don't know. And he said, look, unless you understand about ESP and how it works, you will not be taken in by the control group. Very few people understand. And we didn't know. And during that lecture, I go, oh, that's what Walker was talking about. It was this, this non-local consciousness thing that he was talking about. And the Canadians had said in 1950 that mental phenomena was involved. The Canadians knew this. Mental phenomena was involved with the UFOs. So I was giving this lecture in 2013. And they said to me, they said, hey, are you still going to talk to Pam Dupuy? And I go, well, I guess so. I had no idea. And this woman, she's in her 70s, comes to the house where I'm staying. And she said, what does Stacy tell you about me? I said, nothing. I'm just supposed to talk to you. That's good. She was walking in and she's a remote viewer and she's psychic psychic, and she's working for the CIA and all this. And I, I've heard all these stories a million times. So I wasn't really that impressed. And then she drops it on me and she says, oh, and I was flying the flying saucer last night. And I went, what? She said, you're flying the flying saucer? She said, yeah. I said, they let you fly the flying saucer. I was like, like come on. I was ready to throw her out of the house. Like, you're 75 years old, and you're, you're flying the flying saucer. I'd never heard anything like that in my life. And I said, they let you fly? They, really? Because I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Saudi Arabian women, who at that point weren't allowed to drive a car. Yes. And, and yet, you know, if you get a Saudi Arabian woman, they're going to let you fly the flying saucer with no license, no insurance, nothing. And I, so I said, so how do you fly a flying saucer? And she said, oh, you do it with your mind. And then I realized why she had told me this. And then, again, I was uh, one of these rabbit holes where it sort of opened up. Whether I was given this or not, I'm not sure. But I now have 50 people who have flown the flying saucer, and they will all say, exactly. it's like they're reading off a cue card. It's exactly the same thing. I'll say, stop. How do you fly a flying saucer? And they'll say, well, you go into the craft, and, and then they're there. And, and you, there's, a, there's either a, a beehive, like a, a ball. You put your hand on a ball, or you put your hand on a panel, or you put your hand on a panel on the wall. The craft is alive and you become one with the craft. And, and so you, the craft are together and whatever you think is what the craft does. And everybody, I've got retired U.S. Air Force colonels. I've got 747 United Airlines pilots. I've got all these people and they all say the same thing. It's like they're reading off a cue card and then they'll go in they'll say, I don't know what to do. And the, and the, and the, the, the intelligence is behind them. They don't know if it's a human or a being or whatever. And they'll say, you know what to do, just do it. And it's like they're sort of teaching these people, and it's this consciousness connection again. So that was 2012. I had that download experience. And so I started to look for other people who had had these download experiences. And that's when I discovered that Paul McCartney had written the song Yesterday, the most produced song of the 20th century, in a, a dream. And then I got a phone call from experiencers. So I, I at least understood that if you want to understand the UFO phenomena, 
you, you don't spend time looking at lights in the sky or chasing the government or whatever. You want to talk to the people who claim that they're interacting with the phenomena that are actually dealing with the beings. And I was, so I was talking to these people. And one of them is a guy that has actually been briefed to the president of the United States. He's a guy out of North Carolina, very religious guy. I went to see him, had a very dramatic experience with him. And he phones me up in 2014. He says, I've got a message from the guardians and this is who he's dealing with. So I know this guy's the real deal. And that's when he says to me, he says, and again, this is one of these things where I have no interest whatsoever. He said, I got a message from the guardians for you. I said, really for me, from the guardians? What, what, what do they want me to know? And he says, they want you to know the message is in the music. And I said, well, Chris, uh, I don't know, you're talking to the wrong guy, Chris. I don't listen to music. I don't play music. I have my whole family's musical. I don't, I, I have no interest in music. I'm a radio talk guy. I, I listen to radio talk. I listen to podcasts. I never listen to music. And he said, well, you should listen to Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. And I go, whatever, Chris, you know, and he's, he keeps talking. And then he says, and this is how this phenomena drags you in. You see these synchronicity things. So I'm, there's no way I'm doing this. There's no, I'm not interested. So he says, oh, and the other song you should listen to is a song called After the Gold Rush by Neil Young. And if you look at the lyrics, it basically says we're treating the world like a gold rush. And when the gold is gone, the silver seeds, the flying saucers, are going to take the chosen ones off to another star. This is Neil Young. It's one of the most famous songs. And he's a big environmentalist. He's tried to shut down the, the oil sands in Canada. And I said, Neil Young is involved in this? Neil, you sure? He said, yeah, yeah. And I said, Neil Young. Like I, I mentioned, I live in Winnipeg, which nobody in Canada wants to visit. Neil Young grew up in Winnipeg. And I go, Neil Young's involved in this thing? Neil Young. So that's how it got me going. And I started to look and I realized that all these famous musicians had had a UFO sightings. They'd had encounters. They had claimed that they'd been abducted. They, uh, they had all this kind of stuff. And I realized there was this very direct connection. There was true. There, the message, they were putting it through musicians. And the conclusion I came to is that um, the, the way they want to get the message across, they do it through this weird thing that they'll take you as a child and they'll sort of drop this stuff in and you get there. But when you're 20 years old, they, they're never going to take you when you're 20 years old because who's they? Well, whoever it is, I just call it the intelligence. I'm really not sure who it is. So they, they're not going to interact with you. Like people figure they're getting abducted. So they're not going to abduct you after you're 20 because all your, all your ideas are set. You, your prejudices are set. Everything is set. They, they could care less about you anymore because they're they'd need a big shovel and, a, and rubber boots to get into your brain to get deep enough to put an idea in there because you've got all this other garbage in there that you, you've developed. So what happened, I believe, with the music was that uh, when, when your child is between one and 10 years old, you are your child's hero. You're the greatest in the world. And it's like at, at 10 years old, then it's like, uh, mama, could, could you, uh, my friends around, could you walk like 10 feet behind me? And then it's like 15 years old. And it's like, I don't even want you around when my kids are there. And it's, and what they're doing is the ego is coming online and they want identity. They, they're looking for something in the world. I want to be something. I want to, I want to achieve something. So between the time they're 10 and say 25 years old, who are they listening to? Musicians. And that's why I believe they're putting this stuff into music. They're putting these messages to influence the kids who are looking for something to do in the world. So I had that experience in 2014, and then 2017 was the big one. So you say, did I talk to an alien? I didn't talk to an alien, but I've had a lot of contact with what I call the force. It's, a, it's in the field. It's, I, I get intuitive downloads. I had the one in, in 2012, but in 2017, um, I, I, I walk an awful lot, and that's where I get a lot of this intuitive stuff. And people will get it in the shower. They'll get it when they wake up, just before they go to sleep and stuff, when they're going through the theta state, going into delta and stuff like that. So I walk, and so I would walk downtown, which is about six miles, and it'll take you know a couple, a couple of hours to get there. So I'm walking along, and I've just had coffee. I'm two, I'm two miles away, and I'm walking down the street. And if you've read about, if you know about mystical experiences, it's called this noetic state. So noetic state is something where something comes out of the field and comes into your mind. And Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut, experienced this coming back from the moon. He's coming back and he suddenly is looking at the earth and he suddenly has this oneness experience. He's one with the universe, everything's together. And he basically shuts his whole career down and he starts the Institute for Noetic Studies about this idea about noetic material. So because I'd had this experience in 2012 where you get the feeling, here it is, write, write this down. This is important. It's coming into your head. It's not an idea. So 2017, I'm walking down the street. I know exactly which street I'm on. It's very cold. I got my glove on and it starts to come and I go, oh, it's coming. 
and I get my glove and I take a piece of paper and I take the glove off and I start writing this stuff down. And it starts to give me these things, this, 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 this. And it gets about 15 different things. And then I, it stops. Put the glove back on, put the paper back in my pocket, start to walk. And it starts to come again. And I write it down. It was 24 things. And what this was, was like, a, I, I call it an noetic experience where you're getting it from whoever it's coming from maybe higher self, maybe God, maybe if I, I always call it the force. I have this instinctual thing that I'm dealing with this thing called, I call the force. And so what it was basically saying to me there was this idea of reality. Consciousness was first. And then it said, not only have you got it wrong about how the world works, it's exactly the opposite of what you think it is. So what it would give me is things like, it would say, is the world made out of little nuts and bolts? If it is, that's one world with certain rules. But if the world is made out of consciousness, then that's a completely different world and the rules are all going to change. Is it one life? If it's one life, that's one, that's one world with certain rules and regulations. But if it's multiple lives, it's a completely different world. Is it separate? Are we separate random biological robots floating around in a meaningless universe? That's one world, like the evolutionary world, the Darwinian idea. That's one world with certain rules. But if everything's connected, and, and, and it's one thing instead of separation, that's a completely different world. And so it was this, is it this, is it this? And it's saying, you think it's this, it's this. You think it's this, it's this. And it was these 24 things it was giving me, and I'm madly writing this stuff down. And so I, that's when I started on the whole thing about the contact modalities. I, I would talk to the experiencers, the people who have interacted, because 40% of all experiencers who claim that they've interacted with the, the intelligence behind the phenomena, mm -hmm is almost the same as near-death experiences. When you, and you, you, add, you talk to them, they'll say, you know what? At one point during my experience, I knew the answer to everything in the universe. And 40% and in near-death experiences is almost as high. 50% will say they're, they're suddenly able to heal. Near-death experience, 70% of people say they can heal people. And so I figured like people will say, oh, Louisa, you just anecdotal. You just think you, you had this experience. That's anecdotal. We can't measure it. We can't weigh it. We're not interested in that sort of stuff. And I say, but if you have somebody who said they had the answer to everything in the universe, don't you think we should at least talk to these people? I mean, you can do whatever you want. You know, test them and whatever. But this is important if these people are actually in the field. And that gave me the idea that there is a field, a Kashic field, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, uh, implicate order, whatever you want to call it, where everything is in the field and it's everybody has access to it, but it's the ability to get in the field to access the material. And these people through this UFO type experience, this abduction experience or whatever, in, the, the beings are allowing them into the field. The and intelligence. When they come, yeah, the intelligence. And when they come back into this world, they're in a, a different matrix environment. And when they come back in, they forget it all because they come back and the ego comes back online. And so when I did the contact modality, I came to this conclusion that it's all basically the same thing. The ability to get in the field is the ability for you to shut down the left rational analytical brain where the little voice is saying, Louisa, you're bad. You're in trouble. You're stupid. Don't, this is all nonsense. Don't listen to this. If you can shut it down, that's what you're doing in meditation. You're not quieting the mind, you're quieting the, the little voice in the left brain. Or if you've seen the, the Jill Bolte Taylor, the neuroanatomist from Harvard, who has the left brain hemorrhage. So her left brain is being flooded by blood. And she said, all of a sudden, she said, the little voice got turned off like a remote control by hitting the mute button. It was gone. And she's in, she's as big as the universe. She's one with the universe. And this one, this thing, and the separation is gone. She's one with the universe. And then she comes back online and the little voice says, you're in trouble. You better do something. You're in trouble. And then she, whoop, she the, the blood goes and she shuts down again. And then she's going, this is so cool. How many neuroanatomists can watch themselves having a stroke? I, I, yeah, and, and that's whole idea. Well. And that's what it comes down to is the, abil the ability to shut this left brain down. And there's actually been experiments that show this whole thing that we have two brains. We don't have one. And they, they play off against each other. And that the ego is what keeps you in the physical world. And the idea is, no, you are not the voice in your head. You are not the player on the stage. That's the ego. You are above. You are the person who's watching. And you will go into this life. You'll go into the next life, this whole reincarnation thing. You're just an actor. You've got to remember, you're not the actor on the stage. You are watching the actor and you are just in a play. The ego gets to believe, no, no, it's a, this is real. I'm actually on the stage and I'm, I'm doing this kind of stuff. And that's when the, when the ego gets out of control. That's when I think the problems start. It's this idea of separation versus oneness. 
which was one of the key things it said, is the world separate or is it one? If everybody works together as one, if I, if you all, and it's almost like the left brain, right brain. So the left brain is a male dominated brain. It's me versus you. I'm fighting you. I, I, I'm under attack. The, the, the female brain is on the other side, which is oneness. It's like our family, let's work together. I'm raising my family, this sort of thing. And as I always say, it's like, hopefully the women take over the world before it's too late because the male dom the male idea is, is running the world and it's me versus you. It's, it's battle, it's war, it's uh, survival of the fittest, rape, pillage, kill and steal. Whoever's got the most toys when they die wins. And we have got to move to an idea where the one is more important that we realize whatever we do to Gaia, to our neighbor, to whoever affects the, the entire system. We have an idea where whatever I do doesn't affect everybody else. No, the, the, the intelligence is saying absolutely everything you do influences everything around you. Yes. I mean, look, I completely agree with this whole oneness concept. Ultimately, we are all one. But I just want, I'm just going back again, just back, and then we'll move on to this consciousness and reality, which is so fascinating that you talk about the intelligence or extraterrestrials. I, you're an expert. I am not knowledgeable at all on this subject, but I hear about, you know, all this CIA cover-up and alien abductions. What are your thoughts on that after your nearly 50 years of research? Okay. Well, I used as I, I used I bought into it. Like I'm saying, in 1975, I well, in fact, in 1975, there was really no discussion of of abduction at all. When I in 75, when I had mine, the most famous abduction of all time took time took place. That was Travis Walton. And I always talk about the theory of wow. That I believe that what this phenomenon is doing, it just wants you to go wow. That's all they're doing. They're not doing anything. They're just it's like you see a UFO and it flies around. That's why I said the second night ago, what's it doing? It's not doing anything. It's just there. It wants you. It's going, hello, hello, you see us? And then it, it goes away. Travis Walton was taken for five days. And people get upset in the UFO community when I talk about this. I said, you know why they took Travis for five days? They took him because they said, hey, we want to get the, we want to get the point across. We want everybody to realize like something weird's going on here. So we're going to take him for five days. I said, if Travis Walton had only been taken for two hours, you never heard of the guy. He's the most famous guy on the UFO circuit ever because he was taken for five days. He doesn't remember anything what happened on the ship, or almost nothing. He was taken for five days. So he actually so, disappeared from this reality for five days. Five days. Or, or you, you and, and, but then you have, like people say, okay, they took people against their will. But if you've ever seen Akiana Kermark, who is one of the most famous painters of all time, she draws, she's famous for painting the passion of the Christ, passion of, mm -hmm. of the, uh, uh, Jesus, eight years old. This picture of Jesus, like just like a photograph at eight years old. She disappeared at five years old. And she told the story at five years old. She said that it happened to me. And her impression was that she had been taken by God. She was following this ball of light. She disappeared from her house for six hours. And they were looking for that guard. They had, they had police. They had guard dogs. They had uh, pictures up. They had in questioning the neighbors and stuff. They had this town sealed off so nobody could get her out with her. And she said, I, I could see everybody moving around. And yet I was with this what she considered to be God, like this ball that had this impression of God. She was being taken through the universe. She had a thousand eyes. She could see all this stuff. And she came back and started doing this painting. She's like 25 years old. She has these unbelievable paintings that she's done, but she disappeared. So I said, what did God abduct her? When you start asking questions. So people, when, when people ha talk about the abduction stuff, they will talk to people and they'll say, Oh, so did, did, did they had you on the ship? Uh, were you scared? Did they probe you? Yeah, you that, have a they're baby? the questions that you'd want and to ask, And they go, because right? everybody wants to go to fear. They want to go to the fear yes. thing. So when I go on the ship, I, I, when I get somebody, I say, as I did last night, I sent you this video of the guy with the, with the radios. He's a very, very high profile business guy in the United States. So he, he was talking and I said to him, he had this encounter with this being for 13 days. I said, so uh, Mark, let me ask you, do you have any clothes on? And people always do the same thing. They go, they've never thought about it. They go, <laughs> No, 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 I didn't have any clothes on. And then someone will say, it's a woman. So I said, well, how do you know it's a woman? And they go, I don't know. I, I just know it was a woman. It was a female I was dealing with. Or it was a male. And then I'll say to them, didn't have any clothes on? No. Let me ask you. So you're thinking, well, okay, this is an alien from a foreign planet. So I say, do you have any sex organs? And they go, no, I don't think so. I've never had anybody say. And they go, no. And they said, like, don't you think that's weird? Don't you think that's kind of strange? And then I'll say, do you have a belly button? Do they have nibbles? No, I don't think I had that either. And then I say to and then I say to them, hey, 
I had one one couple from 1946, the first time they saw the being. Now they're 80 years old. I said, hey, let me ask you a question. You saw it in 1946, the being? Yeah. You saw it now? Yeah. So did they ever get any older? They go, no. But aliens give a long time. And they try to justify it. They try to justify the fact that the alien never gets any older. But you can ask these questions all the time. Did it get any older? Or the guy, this guy with the with the radio thing, He, I said, do you have any clothes on? He go, no. And they said, I could see through them. And it's like, is that not, it's kind of weird. Is that not kind of, and that's what the paranormal thing is doing. It's telling you something's wrong. One of your blocks is not right. You've got something wrong here. It's telling you, you've got to look at this, this kind of stuff and you've got to realize it's not what you think it is. And if you've ever seen the research, I did a lot of research on Dr. Michael Newton, who had the, the life between lives. He was a clinical psychologist who would regress people to the past life, take them into the spirit world and stuff like that. And one of his 7,000 regressions, he tells the story. It's almost the same thing happens with the alien abduction stuff. He said, the guy suddenly, the guy said, oh, the devil's here. Oh, my God. The devil's in the room. And he goes, the devil? And he's like, the devil doesn't exist. And he's going, okay, okay, hang on, hang on. Just calm down. And he calms the guy down. And he says, how you know it's the devil? It's the devil. Can you see him? And he's, he's getting all freaking out. And then so Newton says, well, well, hang on. He said, well, what's he look like? He said, oh, he's got leathery skin and he's got fiery eyes. And he says, okay, okay. So what's he wearing? And the guy goes, oh, he doesn't have a body. He doesn't have a body. He just has this like a mist below his chest. And then Newton immediately, that's the whole deal is maybe this is not what you think it is. So Newton basically says to him, take a closer look. Who is it really? He says, move forward in time and tell me what happens. And then the guy goes, oh, scallion, I knew it was. And it was his spirit guide. And what he had been in his last lifetime, he had been a fire and brimstone preacher. And he'd been preaching to people about going to hell. So when he dies in that life, when he, when Newton's reading, bring him through that end of the life, it's scallion, his spirit guide is there and he's got a mask on and he's giving him a lesson about what it's like to be taught that you're going to be going to hell. And so it's the old idea is when something doesn't make, when something doesn't make sense, you have to realize and take a closer look. And what are we really looking at here? But I believe they're higher etheric beings. And we are as well. You got to always remember that you are a, a spiritual being having a physical mm -hmm. uh, experience, not the other way around. Yeah. We think that we're a physical being having a spiritual experience. We are coming in. It's this whole idea. All the world's a stage. We are, Our spirit comes in, plays the role. It goes back out. Or like when my father died, I, I tell the story. My father Two days before my father died, his father comes. My father was a very skeptical guy. He was very sort of didn't want, he would argue with me about different things. And his father comes to him, who died in 1956. And he told my mother, he wouldn't tell me probably because, you know, I'd give him a hard time. And he told my mother, he said, dad was here today. And she said, really? So what do you have to say? My father said, he was just here. That's all you need to know. And the thing was, so my grandfather would have lived hundreds of lives. So why did he come as a physical being? as my grandfather, because if he came as anything else, my father wouldn't know who he was and it wouldn't mean anything. So you can come in, the same as a ghost, you can come in, you can make whatever appearance you want. We think it's very stable, you can't move around. They know you can come in here, you can take on a physical appearance, you can go back into that world. We think there's just this one world and there is no other world out there. And what I've learned from this whole experience, it's less physical than you think it is, it's more spiritual than you think it is, it's connected to dead people it's connected to higher uh spirit guides and it may all be spirit guides it may because i've never seen a, a being but i've had a lot of encounters with what i call the force which appears to me to be like a like you think you're talking to god and then a couple days ago i had the encounter with the one and it was instantaneous like that and i knew it was the one i don't even know what the one is i just maybe because they're playing off my mind it was there i touched it and i went a one it's like oh it wasn't the, the force. So whatever you're seeing and what they found, they've done actually done studies with experiencers and they found that whatever type of being you encounter is based upon your belief system. So if you're very fearful, like a you're going to see experience. Well, yeah, you're going to see a gray. If you're very spiritual, I've got a friend who sees angels. He sees angels or, or, um, uh, high vibrating, um, as, what do you call them? Energy beings. These are very high vibrating people. We'll see that fearful people, people who are um, very high energy, like this woman of the rep reptilian thing has a lot of sex in the book and she's very high energy and stuff like she sees that. And yet before she saw a human being. So you, that's what people don't realize. You are manifesting what you're seeing. People say, no, no, no. It is because everything is a creation of, of our consciousness. So yeah. in essence, are you saying there's a creation of our consciousness? 
that, that it's all it's the whole thing is there's only one thing there's consciousness it's all consciousness and and we are consciousness and it's the old idea where john wheeler said there's no out there out there which if you really take a look this is a nobel prize guy who came up with the black hole the wormhole theory mm-hmm. this nobel prize guy what if that's true what if there is no out there out there that is all here it's all one thing here there's no out there out there they're not coming from anywhere they're here right now and it's all this manifestation that we're all we're all everything that you see or the, the idea of the quantum physics thing. Uh, Einstein being so upset. I'd like to know the moon is behind me when I'm not looking. It's this idea that the particle only comes into existence when you actually, it's absolutely observed. And it's, it's, so that's this manifestation thing that quantum physics is starting to validate this idea that it could all be here, could all be now. All our lives are on top of each other. There's no past, there's no future, there's no physical world. And it's, it's, it's like a, a, one guy called it, it's like a giant kabuki theater. And the only the only message is that it's more complex. It, it's all one, and it's it's much much more complex. You're not alone, and that's what the paranormal thing's about. It, I call it the theory of wow, where you start looking at the stuff they're doing over and over again. You see that they're just they just want you to like they see a UFO. Like why do UFOs have lights on them? They have lights on them so you can see them. They want to go hello. Here we are. Take a look, and they do these weird things that drag you. And down the rabbit hole, make you totally passionate about the thing where you can't let it go. You cannot go. And it, it you, you, you go down the road, but is it you doing this? Because all the people, if you talk to people with abduction experience, I asked Mary Rodwell, who's a very famous, and she's done 3000 regressions in Australia. She, she's been on the show. Yeah. And I, I talked to her. I said, Mary, if you regressed all these people back, these people who have been abducted to birth. And you said at any point in the past, did you agree to be in this situation? How many people would say yes? Mary said, 100%. That's the whole deal. There was one woman, uh, Kathy Martin, who's the, 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 the niece of Betty and Barney Hill, the famous abductee, the first abductee. And I said to her, I said, Kathy, what do you think about this soul contract thing? That there's, there's nothing random happening here, that people are coming in. So it's like, for example, near death, people don't know. People who have had abduction experience, 39% of them have had near-death experiences. And most of those people have had two. And so the question is, is it a random event? Is it random that you had a near-death experience, a random near-death experience, well, and, then you random. Also had a, and you also had a random abduction experience? And so I asked Kathy Martin, I said, Kathy, what's, what do you think about this soul contract thing? That everybody's agreeing that there is no good and there is no bad. It's all just experience. You have agreed to come in to work with these beings because it's, it's this very critical time in, in period. And that we realize that we're going to be in trouble with these higher higher vibrating people are going to come in they're going to work with these aliens and they're going to make this agreement and they're going to try to raise the consciousness of the world and kathy said i always thought about that you know so what i did is i actually got myself regressed and i actually heard the words come out of my mouth when i was young i agreed to this and that's the whole thing people think it's random they think we're a victim the ego says oh we're a victim you know it's hillary clinton and her emails and you know and, and the chinese and the you know these bad people and those bad people and poor old me and then you start to realize if you take responsibility and you know what it's like until you take responsibility for what's happening in your life, you will never solve anything. You have to first acknowledge that, yes, I may, I, whatever has happened, I take responsibility for this and you, and you start to move. So that's the whole, the, the, the concepts that change is this whole idea. It's multiple lives. We're coming in under soul contracts and it's all just a theater. We're all coming in to learn certain lessons, uh, to realize who we all actually are, that we aren't a, 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 an actor on the stage, that we are actually the person watching the thing and that, that this is a play that we're running and that, that and, or Michael Newton says, when you die, you only get asked one question, how did it work out? Because you put the players on the stage, you, you did the whole thing. You can't blame anybody else for what happened. You set the players and, it, and, he's, and Michael Newton says 7,000 people, everybody says the same thing when they get asked that question. Oh, I could have done better. So the only thing we have to remember in life is you and I, if this is true, you and I both agreed before we came in, according to Newton, you see your life before and you're going to meet people and, and you and I are going to have an interview and you're going to do this and I'm going to do this and we're all working together. And, and when you come in, all you have to do is realize who am I really? I'm not the player on the stage. This is just a, a character that I'm playing. I've come in. I, had, I agreed because multiple lives, I came in to do something. What am I supposed to be doing? And am I doing it? And you don't have to worry about what anybody else is doing. You don't have to worry about anything. It's just like, what am I doing? Am I supposed to? Because when you leave, they're going to ask how to work out. And you're going to say, oh, you know, well, you know, if, uh, 
you know, if the, the Chinese hadn't dumped that virus, I would have done something. Man. I, I would have, you know, and it's all these, and they're going to go time out, time out. This is not about anybody else. This is about you. You agreed to do this. You agreed to do that. You came in. You had all these opportunities. You you decided you're going to be abducted. You're going to be a, 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 a podcast show. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And did you do it? And that's all we have to do is remember who we actually are. We are not the player on the stage. We came in. Our player is doing certain things, but we have agreed to do certain things when you come in. And that's when you get the synchronicities. When you're on the on the path and something happens and you run into something, you go, hey, that's that's it, it rings a bell. And that's because this idea, I believe that before you before you come into the world, they talk about going to this giant theater where you start, you see all the players and all the things that the people you're going to meet. When I meet Lu, Louisa, I've got to, I've got to talk to her. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. We've got to do something. And, so this and interview has so, already happened or yeah, certainly yeah. planned. Yeah. And, and, and that's where he actually talks about when he's talking to the guy and he's back in real time because everything's in real time. There is no time. So the guy's in real time and Newton's asking him all these questions and he's in watching his future life and all these things. He's got to meet these people and all sorts of stuff. He said, could you, could you quit asking questions? I, I got to know what I got to do here. <laughs> it could, could bugging me. I'm, I'm trying. And that's the whole thing. So that's this synchronicity thing or this thing when, when you meet somebody or something happens, you know, because you planned this. This is a, a sort of a bell that goes off and you've got to, so you just follow your feelings, realize who you actually are. You're not the player on the stage. You are not the voice in your head. Everything's in action inside consciousness. So it's all consciousness. You control it. Don't blame anybody else for it. Do what you're supposed to do. And when you're finished, you'll feel good because you say, I, I didn't achieve everything I did, but I did the best I could with what I had. That I, I but Most people sort of forget who they are and they get into the rape, pillage, kill and steal. Whoever's got the most toys when they die wins game. And it's sort of like, what can I get? And who, you know, I need more. Even in this, in the spiritual community, even in the UFO community, I call it like uh, spiritual capitalism. We got, we got a big house. We got two cars. We got everything now. We need some spiritual stuff. I mean, we need some entertainment. We need, let's go to a seance and stuff. And a lot of people, I warn people, like when they get into these things where they go out and look for UFOs, don't let this be a game. Because it's, it's sort of just like entertainment. Like, I got done dude night, so uh, let's go and look for UFOs. Or let's, it used to be in the 19th century, all the rich people would go and they'd have seances. Let's, let's go call up some dead people. But it's, it's for entertainment. And you got to realize, what am I supposed to be doing? What, what's my role? And when you're on the, the path, you know you're on the path. Because the synchronicities start to work. Everything starts to go. And you feel good about it. And that's where the passion, I believe, comes in. We are all living a human ex existence and that we will live numerous human ex existences and that we are we came into the world to do something. And once you have that idea, then I think you start doing the right things in terms of uh, being the best person you can, doing the, the most you can with what you've got. Uh, uh, the Bible even says too much is given, much is expected. No, and Edgar Casey said, knowledge not used is sin. Those are the things that have driven me my whole life. It's this idea that when you get over to the other side, you're going to say, you know, oh, man, I just, you know, I, I should have done this. I should have done that. And so I've spent my whole life trying to figure out, like, what am I supposed to be doing? And when you actually open up and allow it, that's when the synchronicities start happening. And you will be directed. You will be directed where to go and what to do. But you got to let keep the left brain because left brain wants to get in there. And it wants to say, no, nah, this is garbage. Uh, you, you know, you're in trouble. Just you know, do this, do that and, and, and get the fear state. When you're in the fear state, everything goes backwards. Everything starts to fall apart in the fear state. And that's why I say that's when the evil comes in, where people start to believe there's separation and it's it's your fault. It's your fault that I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. And then I strike out at you and I strike out at somebody else. And re when you realize you are the spark of the divine, you are in charge of this game, uh, that you can't blame anybody else. That, um, and, and sort of take it easy because, I mean, all of sin and falling short of the glory of God, and this kind of stuff uh, that we all are making mistakes and it's, it's a, it's a game. Enjoy the game. Uh, but realize that if multiple lives is a fact, there's almost no doubt if multiple lives is a fact that we came in here to do something, we plan to do something to come in here and who knows what it is. And then you have empathy for the people who don't understand because not everybody needs to be where you and I are that, you know, to that you and I are in a worse position because if you know something, you're in a worse position because if you get on the other side, and you really didn't know anything. Then they're going to say, well, cut him a break. I mean, it's got no, but you knew, yeah. you, you knew, you knew what was going on and you didn't do anything. And that's where it's very dangerous. The more, you know, because then the, the onus is on you too much is given much is expected. And that's what always scares me is, uh, you know, trying to do the best I can 
in terms of understanding that it's multiple lives and that um, that there's this progression and that I came here to do something and uh, I've got to figure out what it is. And I think I figured it out because I, I, I and, and in, the, in this uh, breakthrough thing, when I've been in the mystical state, the weird thing I actually wrote about it the other night is very, very strange. This, I don't know if you've ever experienced this thing with gratitude. And, and it just drives me nuts. Like you're in a mystical, mystical state. You figure like, oh, man, this is cool. I mean, in this mystical state, you just sit and enjoy it. Not me. I'm sitting there and I'm waiting like, where's that little twerk? That little gratitude thing. It's, it's the weirdest thing. It comes in. And I always post. I post after I say, I am the luckiest person that ever lived on the earth. And, and if you think you're luckier, get your chips, put them on the table, and I'm going to check your pockets to make sure you're not holding back any chips. I will call you i am the luckiest person and it's this thing that comes over i don't know how they do it i said if you could figure out how they do this you can make a billion dollars overnight it's the most amazing thing i've had it happen a dozen times i cannot figure it out i sit there when it's happening i'm going how is this done it's like you it, the gratitude it's like times a hundred it's just like the weirdest thing and i think that's the left brain being shut down when you suddenly the ego gets out of the way and you're one with all it is the feeling is unbelievable. And I just like, just drives me nuts. I'm just sitting here because I'm waiting for it to come. It's like, I've got no gratitude yet. Where's the gratitude? And suddenly it's there and you can't shake it off. I tried to get rid of it. I tried to make it go away. I can't make it go away. Oh, you and don't want like, it to go away. Gratitude is yeah, wonderful strange. thing. I can't figure out how they do that. But but I think that's what it is. is well, once I think you, you're doing it, aren't you? Since yeah, well, we once you, once you, that's the thing is your ego is shut down. Your your ego is, is out of the way and you're one with all that is. And that's this bliss state. That's that's this mystical state that you're you're one with all that is. Grant Cameron, we've discussed such a huge range of topics. Is there something I haven't asked you that you'd like to talk to the Passion Harvest audience about? No, I, I always leave people with this this idea that um, you have to uh, have gratitude for the fact that we are eternal, and keep in mind, you are not the player on the stage. You are not the voice in the head. That we came into the world to do something and that we all we have to do is figure out what we're supposed to do what we came in here to do don't worry about anything else don't let anybody else upset you and um, do what you can and everything will work out okay that's what I always want to remind people that's to me is the bottom line it's all one thing uh, we are a part of an eternity and once you get out of the um, this ego mind you're going to realize how magnificent it is uh, you, you, you have absolute knowledge. Once you leave the world, you start to understand how it all fits together. You, and then you agree to go back through the river of forgetfulness to forget again, to go into another lifetime. Uh, but you have to try as much as possible to realize who you actually are. You are not the voice in the head. You are not the player on the stage. You are the eternal spark of the divine that has come here for his physical experience to learn lessons of gratitude, empathy, love, understanding all these things enjoy it, do what you can. And uh, that's all That's all I like to remind people. Remember, it's all one and you're part of it. And we came in here for a reason. Great message. Thank you so much. So where can people find you? And I will put all the links in the show notes as well. The only things I really recommend, I my daily stuff when I have find things, I, I have my presidential UFO Facebook site is where I post mm -hmm. um, uh, stuff there. Um, I, all my books, I have, uh, there'll be about 12 books within a couple of weeks. Uh, they're all on Amazon. You can go there. I mean, people don't read very much. The main one is my white house UFO grant camera and YouTube channel. So I have your video on there and I do like you, I find somebody that's really weird. And I like, I go, wow, I like to talk to that person <laughs> because you know, in an interview, like if you, if you talk to people in a you send a message, they, they'll sort of ignore this question and that question. But usually when you interview people, you can ask them questions that you would never get away with anywhere else. And so I, I, to me, it's like, this person's interesting. They have something that I would like to know. And that's why I do all these interviews. So I do a lot like you. I do a lot of near-death experience. They're interviews. amazing interviews. So I encourage everyone. I, to I do a lot less UFO stuff. I keep getting dragged in because I have this sort of background on government cover-up and president stuff. But mostly, I, if I could drop that, I would drop it. I'm more into uh, this idea of consciousness um, and near-death experience, uh, psychic phenomena, channeling, all this kind of stuff, because that's where it's at. That's, I think, will explain to you what's going on. It's the weird things in the world. It's like the, you're seeing the devil. It's like when you say, this isn't what you think it is. Take a closer look. 
What is this really? Or um, I, one, let me give you one thing. Um, we, we talked about this thing about wrong blocks. This is an idea that was given to me. I would like to express this. So it's the idea that we have these blocks and we think we have made this mistake. We think the world is all solved. We've got it all solved. And we're just waiting for one more thing and we'll figure it all out. And in fact, it's all wrong blocks. So in 1492, we thought the world was flat, wrong block. We thought the sun went around the earth. That was very evident, but it's wrong. Uh, everything's solid, wrong. Uh, the world's not spinning. We're stationary. No, we're moving at a thousand miles an hour into the east. And that was one thing that gave me that the uh, the message was given to me is it's you got the wrong blocks. You're shuffling these blocks around, and they're all wrong. You got to get the right blocks, and that's where you, you the paranormal comes in. It will tell you where the right there's a new block. You need to learn something new because this shouldn't happen in the, in the world that you think is is happening. And the two expressions they tied into this uh, were, and they've given it to me numerous times. They keep reminding me of this. One was by Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein Stein said, you cannot solve a problem using the same information that you use to create the problem. That's this idea. You can't be shuffling right. the blocks around. And the other one was William James, who said, you think you're thinking. You're actually just rearranging your prejudices. And so that's uh, one of the things that I think is, is one of the messages that really made sense to me. And the, the, the problem we have is that when you get to 20 years old, not only uh, do you have the wrong blocks, but you glue all the blocks together in your head. And they ain't even moving after that. They, they're there. So people get stuck in this one world view, which makes you and I important that we're on the leading edge of what I call the Super Bowl. If you understand what's going on here, whether you call it the World Cup soccer game or, or the Super Bowl, if you understand the, the bottom line, not the aliens, forget the aliens, forget spirits, whatever, if you understand what's really going on in terms of what you and I are studying. This is the biggest story of all times. There are no bigger story. And you and I, Louisa, we got to be in the stadium. We're not outside. Most people live lives of quiet desperation. They have no idea what's going on. You and I know what's going on. We're in the stadium. Now, you may be the, the, the quarterback. You may be the water boy or the water girl, uh, but you're in the stadium. And accept the fact, the, 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 be honored that you got to play in the biggest game of all time. So I always tell people when they have a story, I experience it, I say, you written that down? And they go, well, no. I say, no, you got to write it down for your kids. You got to write it down because 500 years from now, your great, great grandchildren are going to say, oh, that Louisa, man, she knew what's going on, man. She was right on. She was one of the first. It's like living at the time of Jesus or, or some very important time that we're here we know what's going on and you got to appreciate the fact you got to play in the biggest game of all times because you know what's going on. People do, do not on the outside, but you and I do. And we have to appreciate the fact that we got to play in this really, really important game and pass the message as much as we can to everybody else that this game is going on in the world. I don't know if I should start cheering, but that was fantastic. <laughs> Which is another one they gave me. They gave me this gratitude. I'll, I'll end with this. They okay. gave me this gratitude thing. I'm in. I'm in the field. I'm in. I'm in the, the, the field, and I, I'm frustrated with this gratitude thing. I'm. It's like it just bogging me. I'm trying to figure out how does this work. How do they do this? How do, How does this gratitude thing work? And I'm. And I get frustrated. And I said, I don't know what to do. And this voice comes in and says, You know, Grant, you're an old guy. What you do? Stand up and do a standing ovation, and just keep standing until you fall over dead. <laughs> oh my gosh! Laughing. Sense of humor, hey. <laughs> yeah. Well, the universe has got an incredible sense of humor. It's like, uh, uh, that's what I noticed, but it's very, it's very, very, sometimes when I describe it, people think I'm, I'm, I'm making it up that the world is, is the universe is cruel. The, the universe, the way this described to me, it's like a, a grade six teacher who's done it for 40 years. And the little kid comes along and says, Hey, I'm here this year. I'm special. Get out of here, kid. I'm, I'm not stupid. I know what's going on. There are rules, kid. Here's how it works. You follow the rules. You may spend grade six in bliss. If you don't follow the rules, you may die. The universe people want to have this, like um, a world where it's all fuzzy and warm or whatever. The universe is rules. There are rules and regulations. There are, it's all set. And you're the one that plays. You're, depending how you do, depends whether it works or doesn't work. The universe is not involved. It's, it's independent. It just sets up all the rules. And, and you're the one that navigates through there. Whereas people sort of have this idea where... Uh, uh, the universe is love, and, and that's what they said to me. They gave me the expression that the universe is love, therefore, they're gonna get, you're going to cut you all these corners. They're going to give you a break here, and they're going to give you a break there. And the universe says to me, they said, the, the, the core of the universe is love. 
but don't, conf don't confuse us with your cookie baking grandma. And this is this idea that it, it's the way you are creating the world. You are creating the good, the bad, your bad stuff, and you have to take responsibility for it, that all the rules are set up there. It's all been set up in like the laws of physics, whatever you want to call them. And it's you and I operating in those that determine how well we do or how well we don't do. And you can't blame Hillary Clinton. You can't blame the dog. You can't blame, you know, the Chinese or the Russians or everybody wants to play the blame game. We are playing in this world. Everything has been set up. And if you do it properly, you will end up in bliss. If you don't do it properly, you will end up on the other end. That We are the creators of our own destiny. And we got to quit trying to blame everybody else and play the victim role, which is what the ego wants you to do. It wants you to believe you're a victim and uh, everybody's against you and uh, you've gotten a rough time and, and uh, everybody's got a better deal than you have. So uh, uh, um, we'll leave it at that. Great. <laughs> well, Grant Cameron, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. It so many so concepts and ideas to think about. Thank you for sharing Wonderful. that with the Passion Harvest audience. Hope, hopefully people pick something up from it. Thanks. Thanks very much. Bye, Grant. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Talk Bye. To you. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.